Y'all ready for the word? You've been enjoying the Glory of God series? I don't know about you, but whenever I heard glory, um, it was always a, uh, a subject matter that was hard to understand. The glory of God. It's so serious, right? Um, but before there, before I go there, I just was reminded of something in my head. Um, South Sac, Pastor Caleb um, and I, we are the lead pastors of the church. He is at our South Sac campus right now, and I'm gonna head over there after this message and preach over there. But um, we have another campus, if you didn't know, and if you um, are interested in something called uh, Triumph Over Trauma, uh, this is something that you can be a part of if you're wanting to look for healing. You wanna be a part of a conference that talks about healing and deliverance. Um, it is going to be happening at our South Sac campus tonight at six o'clock. So if that's something that you wanna be a part of, you wanna be healed from trauma, I forgot to mention that, make sure you go to our South Sac campus uh, tonight. Everybody say tonight. Triumph over trauma. Okay, it's great. I didn't really help you with that. So anyways, glory of God, are you ready? When I, when I thought about this word glory, oftentimes uh, glory to me was like when older women would raise a hanky and they would start going like this and they go glory to God, right? Right? Glory. That was glory. Like, what does glory mean? Um, and oftentimes when we are at uh, or watching award ceremonies, people are giving glory to God. And what does that mean? And so I want us to start understanding it, not in the context of how people have used it historically and not in the context of how people use it in pop culture. Because everybody, whether they're living for the Lord or not, they are giving glory to God from behind a podium and a mic. And I want us to understand it to the degree that God wants us to know it as a church, as Project Church. What is he trying to do through Project Church? And how is he um, wanting us to grasp this concept of the glory of God? And so a couple weeks ago, Pastor Caleb opened up the series. I don't call my husband Pastor Caleb, by the way. Um, but Caleb opened up the series uh, only when I'm in trouble. Just kidding. Wow, I shouldn't go there. Two weeks ago, <laughs> he opened up the series and he gave us a working definition for glory. And here it is. God's glory is the magnificence, worth, loveliness, and grandeur of his many perfections. This is the glory of God. And when he taught on the glory of God, he was teaching through Genesis and helping us understand that God is glorified when you look at all creation. The creation that he called good. He created the sky, he created the heavens, he created the earth, he created the people, he created the, the animals, he created the plants, all of those things he called good. And the glory of God is expressed through his creation. We go to the mountains for some peace. Oh, the glory of God. That's where people experience the glory of God. But we also experience the glory of God through the creatures that he created. All of you are his creatures. He created you. And the glory of God, whether you believe it or not, can be displayed through you, through your intricate design, but even deeper through the way you allow him to change and transform you. That is when God is glorified. But this week, I wanna focus on experiencing God's glory through his presence. Now, we say this at Project Church. We have a lot of core values like every organization should have, right? But one that we added last, last year in 2023 was the, the blueprint or the core value of the presence is our priority. The presence of God is our priority. And, and, I, and I want us to understand really that glory of God and the presence of God go hand in hand because the second working definition that we have in this series is that the glory of God is the manifest presence of God. I mean, I got like one head nod here, but it's still a little mystical, isn't it? But when you un understand what the word manifest means, it means to be made clear or to make obvious. The glory of God is made obvious when we finally experience his presence. You know what experiencing his presence means? It means experiencing how magnificent he is. Experience how worthy he is. You, when you experience the loveliness of who God is, when you experience the perfection of God, when imperfect people identify that we are so imperfect, we need a perfect God, he is glorified. 
When you come in contact with the presence of God, there is potential for you to bring glory to him. So I want us to talk about this priority of the presence of God. Again, we say this when we come to church, oh, the presence of God is a priority. And all of us are like, yes, presence of God. What does that mean exactly? (laughs) Anybody? It's okay, you can admit it. Well, when the presence of God is not the priority among the people that are gathering week after week, can I tell you this, that church merely becomes an event, a presentation with a bunch of talented people on stage. And it becomes still a rote weekly occurrence that actually does not add value to your life. Can I tell you that right now? If church is just something that you are checking off the list of things to do, when the presence of God is not the priority that you have in coming to church, then can I tell you that it is not gonna change your life. If you're looking for a life change, it's not gonna be changed until the experience of church becomes an encounter with a person of God. When we encounter the person, when we encounter his loveliness, when we encounter his magnificence, when we encounter his perfection and how imperfect we are and our need of him, we finally are confronted with the person of God and the presence of God allows us to bring glory to God. Are you following? And here's the thing. When our priority is his presence, then we are filled with, with purpose of God. When we are filled with purpose, then we understand the meaning of life. We understand a joy. And sometimes the joy is inexplicable because we're not doing so well in other areas of our lives. But there's a joy that comes merely by knowing who he is. And when you encounter his presence, when you encounter the person of Jesus, that it, this church thing and this gathering with other believers is not this rote religious activity. It becomes a thriving relationship with a person who has the power to change and transform you in your life. But we're not gonna bring God glory if we're not prioritizing the presence. So I wanna tell you this right now, it's a little bit of a warning, especially for those who call Project Church their home and you have called yourself a Christian for more than, if you've been walking with the Lord for a long time. This is a little bit of a warning and a little bit of a correction. I'm gonna start trying to do this with my kids because um, sometimes when you're delivering something that can almost seem harsh, it comes off better when someone's smiling at you, right? So I'm going to start doing this with my kids because oftentimes I actually just yell and I look stern. But here I want to give a warning and a bit of correction to the people of God, including myself. But when the people who seek to be in the presence of God, when we seek to prioritize his presence, can I tell you, you bring him glory. But the people who are not prioritizing the presence of God in their lives, I'm afraid that you're living out empty goals and vain ambition. And whether you realize it or not, you're not bringing glory to God. You are trying to bring glory to yourself. (laughs) So the place that I want to start is understanding his presence so that we can give him glory so that you're not coming in here to just check off a box on your list. It's so that you come here and you meet with other believers, either here in your workplace, at school, at the coffee shop, that you're meeting with a body of believers, you're meeting other people with faith, with the priority of his presence, so that you don't say the same, but you are being sanctified and you're becoming more like him so that you can bring him glory. That is what God has called us to do and called us to be. God people who bring him glory. So the starting place for this is actually in the Old Testament. The Old Testament. Um, How many people have seen the movie Prince of Egypt? I know Caleb referenced that a couple of weeks ago. Um, It's really just a Cliff Notes version of what happened in Exodus, okay? So the people of God, the Israelites, they were um, in bondage to the Egyptians and they were freed and they were set free and then they were chased after Pharaoh and his people and when they got to the Red Sea they were like oh shoot we're we're um, we're trapped so they took Aaron's rod they put it in the Red Sea and then the seas were parted right do you guys know the story and then all the chariots and uh the the 
the people, the, the army of Pharaoh, they all drowned into the sea. And so now Moses, after being set free by God, ultimately, God is telling them to walk the wilderness and he's telling them, while you're in the wilderness, I need for you to set up a place where I can dwell. Because you don't have a home anymore. You're no longer in Egypt. Now you're just roaming the wilderness. I'm gonna try to get you the, that promised land. Um, it took a little while. They were a little stubborn. But every time they, they, I just want you to understand, they weren't like roaming every night and finding a new place every day. There were times they would settle in an area for up to seven years and they would have to set up a tabernacle. And this tabernacle, was a place that was um, that God gave Moses very specific instruction on how to build, what materials to use, um, the length of uh, the space that they were going to inhabit, um, the tent, how it was be would be pitched, and how what what was in all of the areas, uh, the outer courts, the holy inner courts, and then the holy place. Like there's this whole tabernacle. And I want you to understand that there was a lot of intention that went behind the building of a tabernacle. And we want to start here because when the tabernacle was finally built, the people were like, all right, we're done. You gave us all this instruction. What do we do with it now? And they were like, is the presence of God going to come? He said he wanted us to build this place so that his presence could dwell. Do you understand? Like they're, this God that they're worshiping, this God that rescued them from Egypt, this God that performed the miracle that is giving them food from heaven day after day, this God who parted the Red Seas for them, they needed this God's presence to dwell somewhere so that they can worship him, okay? And so here we are, Exodus 40, 34. Are you following me? You guys good? Okay, not that was, I'm not sure by that response. But Exodus 40, 34, here's what happens. The tabernacle's built and here's what it says. Then the cloud covered the tent of meeting. The tabernacle was under a tent, okay? And I'm gonna show you pictures here in a moment. But then the cloud covered the tent of meeting and the glory, everybody say glory, of the Lord filled the tabernacle. The glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle. The presence of God filled it. And you know the way it looked? Like miracles are happening left and right for the people of God, okay? They're seeing, they're seeing food drop from heaven. They're being led by a pillar of or fire. I mean, it's crazy. The, the seas are being parted for them. And now they're getting to see the presence of God by, by seeing a cloud that just hovered and, and just went throughout the tabernacle, went throughout the tent. Can you imagine like when we are worshiping here and we're praising God and we're raising our hands and we're singing songs and all of a sudden a cloud just fills this room? That's what happened in the tabernacle. The presence of God, the tangible presence of God. I mean, when, when, when it gets humid, you can't see the humidity, but you can feel it, right? So the people, they could feel it. It filled the temple. It filled the tabernacle. And the reason why I'm starting here is because the prerequisite for understanding the glory of God is understanding the tabernacle. Everybody say tabernacle. The tabernacle. In the Old Testament, there wasn't the Holy Spirit because the Holy Spirit came after Jesus. Jesus wasn't alive during this time. So all they had was this understanding of God and this story that was passed down to generation to generation. And now they're starting to experience tangible manifestations. And it was obvious that God was real. It was obvious that God was real and it was made real in the tabernacle. The tabernacle, the definition for that is a house or dwelling place. The house or dwelling place. The tabernacle. Why is this important for us to understand the presence of God? It's because the... If the presence of God is a tangible manifestation um, of who God is, then we, every single one of us who are called to inhabit his spirit, the one who um, Jesus left this earth and then he left the spirit for us and the spirit fills us up when we have faith in him. And so ultimately, all of us are called to be tabernacles. All of us are called to uh, inhabit the presence of God. We are all the people who spirit can be dwelt in us. 
Does that make sense? Are you following me? So we're all called to be tabernacles. If we're gonna understand his presence, then we are gonna be people who invite the presence of God to invade our lives and be like a cloud that just takes over our minds and our hearts and it motivates every decision we make, every step we take, every time we say no to the wrong things and yes to the right things. It's when we say we prioritize your presence it's in our lives and I'm not gonna do anything that is outside of your will. I'm gonna follow your will because we're your your will is, it's, in a better gen, and it, it's a better agenda, and that's where I can experience your perfect peace. How many people want peace in this place? If you want the peace of God, if you want the presence of God, if you want to experience His loveliness, if you want to experience the grandeur of His perfections, then you are going to be a tabernacle that invites His presence into your life. And that happens by way of coming to church, spending time with other believers, it comes by being a tabernacle. So today, I don't want you to experience church today as just an event. It's not just even an experience. This is an opportunity for you to encounter the person of Jesus. I believe there are people here who, have, who, who maybe have walked away from the Lord or your relationship with God has just kind of become going to church. And God is inviting you to a deeper connection with him so that you encounter not just a bunch of happy people. No, you encounter the person of God who can change and transform you and your life. Do you want your life to be transformed today? Just two, that's great. I'm hopeful for you guys. So in order for us to understand his presence, we need to understand his tabernacle. So I wanna walk you through the tabernacle that Moses followed instructions by God, and it's going to help you understand how you can find a way to peace, to perfect peace, to the Holy One, to have a relationship with Him. And again, for you to be transformed, for the situations that are burdening you to be lifted from you, yeah, God's gonna set some people free as we understand this. So I have some pretty pictures so that I can keep your attention. You ready to learn today, church? All right, so we're gonna talk about the tabernacle. Isn't that a beautiful picture? This is a um, depiction of what the tabernacle probably looked like. And there's three main areas that I want to describe to you. The first being the outer courts. The outer courts is everything outside of the tent where you see a little altar and a, a brazen um, bronze place where the priests would wash their hands. I'll talk to you about that in just a second. But the outer court is where justification would take place. In this day and age, um, there were 613 laws that the Israelites and the people of God had to follow. 613. <laughs> That's kind of a lot. It's um, moral laws, ceremonial laws, and judicial laws, okay? And so in order for them to be in right standing with God, in order for them to be righteous, in order for them to be pure, in order for them to have um, uh, access to God, they had to be justified because here in the outer courts, it contains the brazen altar. The brazen altar is where a sacrifice had to be made. And the focus of the outer courts is sacrifice, judgment, and cleansing. Kind of like what Sam was saying, we, are, we ask God in his presence to cleanse us, to make us clean, to make us um, whole, right? And this whole area is about 1,500 cubics. Cubics is the, I want you to touch the tip of your middle finger and then touch along all the way to your elbow. That is a cubic. And there were 1,500 of that cubic, um, cubics to make up that space, which is interesting because there's 1,500 uh, years approximately that the Mosaic law, this law that I'm talking about, um, was instituted. But this area, everything was in it was made of bronze because bronze signified judgment. This is what the law does. When you break the law, and there were so many that it was inevitable, right? If, if there's 613 laws that you have to follow, you're going to break one probably, right? And the law pronounces you guilty for that judgment and a blood sacrifice is required. 
So an animal had to be sacrificed on that altar before they can make their way into the holy place and the holy of holies. In that tabernacle, in that tent is where the presence of God resided. Are you following me? So this outer court is so important for you to understand because it is the only way into the holy place. It is the only way into the tent. The outer courts requires a sacrifice. Justification is needed. And if you know this and you know the gospel, I'm, I hope you're getting excited because I'm getting excited. But if you've never heard this, um, follow along. It's a great journey. So that's the outer courts. But then you go into the tent and there's this holy place. Can we get the holy place? In the holy place, there's a rectangular chamber measuring 20 cubits. And in this place, only priests were allowed to go. So the general public and all the people sin in, they go out in the outer courts and they make sacrifices. That's where they are cleansed and purified. But then priests go into the holy place and in the holy place, they have to clean themselves with the bronze laver, which was, um, which was in the entrance of the holy place. So can I tell you this? <laughs> Imagine this, imagine if this church was a tabernacle. Imagine that you couldn't come into this place. When we worship God, when we sing songs to him, that's where we experience the presence of God, right? When we hang out with people, you experience the presence of God in here, right? So how, how weird would it be if I was just like, excuse me, before you enter the double doors, could you please kill a calf or a lamb before you enter? Are you thankful that we don't have to do that every time we meet with God? Are you grateful for that? And so here in this time, only priests came. So what if I was like, well, first I need you to go through a nine month course where you get licensed to be a minister of the gospel and then you can come in and worship with us. Wouldn't that be awful? That, that's what's happening here. That's what's happening in the Old Testament. In order for people to access the presence of God, there were so many things ke keeping them from it. So here we are in the holy place. Only the priests can go in there. They have to clean themselves before um, so that they can be pure because in the holy place, that's where sanctification happens. Sanctification is a purification of people of their sins. So priests would go in and when they go in and they get sanctified, it's like their, their sins are being washed away for the people who made burnt offerings out in the outer courts. You follow? So here we are. In the holy place, this is where the, there's showbread. There's um, 12 uh, pieces of bread that signify the 12 tribes of Judah, the people of God. And that's where there's a gold lampstand. The, the gold stands for the purity that's happening in the holy place where sanctification is happening. That's where the menorah is. They light the menorah. And that this is also where the altar of incense is. And an altar of incense, when they burn, when the priests burn the incense, all the, everything that's coming up, it's like signifying the prayers going up to heaven to go to God. Are you following? Okay, so this is what's happening in the holy place. Only priests can go in there and they're doing some um, stuff <laughs> that, that are really cleansing them. And their priests are getting cleansed for the people. Remember, 613 laws, that's a lot. And then just beyond a veil. Can you show me the veil? There's a veil that was, again, intricately made, very heavy, and it was meant to withstand all the traveling, withstand time. You know, it was going to last for a long time. This place, the Holy of Holies, is separated from the holy place by this veil. And in this perfect cube, 10 cubits um, in length, width, and height, it's where the Ark of the Covenant, anybody watch Indiana Jones? Anybody? Indiana Jones, the Ark of the Covenant. Okay, the Ark of the Covenant is where the tablets from Moses, uh, the law, the Ten Commandments are in there. Um, also in there is the rod that split the Red Sea for the people of God to go through. So it, it signified the miracles. When you understand the presence of God, you understand you have access to miracles in your life. And there's also in the Holy of Holies, a jar of manna, because like I said earlier, the people, as they were wandering the wilderness, the Israelites, there was manna coming from the sky. That's the food that they got to eat. And so this, again, this jar of manna signified God's presence in their lives. 
You know, I think some of us don't realize how many miracles God is doing in our lives. And when there are miracles happening in our lives, when there are blessings in our, happening in our lives, when there are coincidences that are happening in our lives, they're not actually coincidence. It is evidence of a God who cares about you. It is evidence of a God who wants to be in communion with you. He wants you to be in his presence. He wants you to experience him. But here in this day and age, only the high priests could go into the Holy of Holies. And they could only go in there once a year. Can you imagine just going to church once a year? You're like, a couple of you are like, I only go to church once a year (laughs) on Christmas or Easter twice. (laughs) But we know that the regularity of meeting with the people of God gives us a level of accountability and a level of faith and a level of encouragement. But here, shoot, they could only meet with the presence of God and not even all the people, just the high priest once a year. And in this once a year ritual, there was purification, sacrifice, and an offering of blood for the forgiveness of all the sins of the people. And that's where the presence of God dwells. But here's the thing. I told you everything about the tabernacle. This is all in order for people to be in right standing with God. But if you have been walking with the Lord for very long, or if you've understood what this whole faith thing is about, you understand that Jesus is the reason we don't have to do all this anymore. Jesus is the reason that Project Church didn't need to set up with an outer court, then a holy place, and then just the Holy of Holies where Caleb and Chrissy could go in. Probably only Caleb, because back in this day, it was a little bit more patriarchal, whatever. So, um, so the Holy of Holies could only have one person a year. Then church wouldn't even exist. Do you hear me? And so I, I need you to understand that the prerequisite for understanding the glory of God is seeing our need for Jesus. Because here's what happened. When Jesus walked the earth, when he was born, and then he died, and then he rose again, when the when he died, there was an earthquake and the veil that you saw a picture of, it was torn in two. And that signified that no longer did we need a priest or a high priest in order to access the presence of God. The the veil was torn because Jesus was the ultimate sacrifice, because Jesus is the only way to the Father. This is the gospel message, and we have to understand the tabernacle if each of us are to be those tabernacles that allow the presence of God to dwell in us. If we want to be changed and transformed, then we need to go from the outer courts to the inner courts to the Holy of Holies and get to Jesus and get to his presence so our life doesn't have to be miserable, so our life doesn't have to be purposeless, so our life doesn't have to be full of anxiety, so that we can have the presence of God that gives us perfect peace. Do you want his peace today? Do you want his presence today? Do you want his forgiveness today? Do you want to stop walking in guilt? Do you want to stop walking in shame? Then you have to be a tabernacle that allows him to justify you, then sanctify you, and then he is glorified through you. But here's the thing, John 1, 14, it says, in the beginning was the word and the word was with God. And the word was God. So that's just a fancy way of saying in the beginning of time, Jesus existed because Jesus is God, okay? But then later on in verse 14, it says, and the word became flesh and dwelt among us. And we have seen his glory. Somebody say glory. Glory as the son of from the father, full of grace and truth. When it says the word became flesh, that's like the mystery of God coming to this earth. Oh my gosh, this God came to earth and he inhabited like he was in the middle of like human skin. (laughs) And this perfect God came to earth in an imperfect body that was whittling away, dying. We're all dying. I hate to say it. It's the truth though. And this is what Jesus did, the God of the universe came down to be a human. And what it says is the word became flesh and dwelt among us and his presence was here. It dwelt among us. Another translation actually says a deeper understanding of Hebrew will tell you that the word became flesh and he pitched a tent among us. 
Isn't that interesting? He pitched a tent among us. And even more specifically, when you really drill down the Hebrew, it says the word became flesh and he tabernacled among us. We have to be tabernaclers. We have to be tabernaclers because here's what happens. That was really hard to say. Tabernacler, that, I did, I, that was terrible. So that we can be justified for our sin, sanctified and cleaned up, and then we are allowed to, be, to give him glory. So here's the thing, guys. The prerequisite for understanding the glory of God and his presence in your life that can change you and transform you The prerequisite for that is understanding your need of him. Can I tell you, every single one of us need Jesus. Every one of us are sinful, decrepit, imperfect people. Without the presence of God, we are nothing. Without his salvation, we have nothing. And so why do we need Jesus? I, my goal today is for, to get you to understand that when there is an impartation of desperation on your life, then you can finally bring him glory. You can finally experience peace. You can finally experience forgiveness. You can finally be full of purpose that is a purpose meant for the kingdom that lasts for eternity. So many people are walking around this earth depressed and hurt and anxious and anxiety ridden because they have not met the perfect one. And tabernacling is only an opportunity for you to be connected with the savior of the world. And I want an impartation of desperation today that says I need him. I'm nothing without him. I don't care if I'm called pastor or reverend, I need him. We, we all need him. So why do we need Jesus? Let's take another journey through the tabernacle again. We need Jesus because he first justifies us in the outer courts where there had to be uh, an animal that was, was slain, right? Jesus is the only way. The outer courts is the only way to the presence of God. Do you hear me? We need Jesus. He is the only way. He is the only one who can justify us. We cannot act a good life until we're justified. Anything we do is short of justification. Only Jesus can justify us. It says in John 10, 9, I am the gate. Whoever enters through me will be saved. He will come in and go out and find pasture. What is that pasture? It's the green pastures where there is peace, where there is plenty, where there is provision for everything you realize you didn't need oh you didn't realize you needed (laughs) that's what I meant come on you're justified in the outer courts and then you get to the holy place and this is where he sanctifies you you know where the where the priests were cleaning themselves off and they were getting cleansed and purified this is where you are cleansed this is where you are sanctified and that brings him glory It brings him glory. And this is where the altar of incense is burned. I want you to know, it's a song that we're gonna sing after this. It's a great response song. But your life is an altar. Your life is worship to him. The the choices you make, the sacrifices you make, the time you give to him, the money that you give to him, the talents that you give to him in the name of Jesus and the glory that you bring him, that is worship to him. And when you worship him, it's like incense being burnt. And I want you to know that when we're not cleansed, when something is gross and dirty and it's like, it's being burnt, it stinks. And when animals were burnt, Birds as sacrifices, the incense was made to cover up the smell of the burning animals so that the worship would be really a, a sweet aroma for the God that we are giving our sacrifice to. So I want you to know that the only way your worship will be made a sweet aroma in his presence is when you are sanctified. When you allow him to sanctify you, you will never be able to do anything to prove yourself to God. He knows who you are. Jesus was the savior of the world. That is your only way to sanctification. It's gonna cause, it's gonna cost you. What are you sacrificing? Is this something that just is convenient? Because it's right before the brunch lunch, you know, menu. And it just works in the beginning of your day. 
Or is it because, man, I'm dedicating this time to the one who gave me breath in my lungs. He deserves my worship at the beginning of the week. Or is it just an afterthought? Man, let your life be a sacrifice to him. And here's what I, where I really wanna end. We we're in the outer courts, that's where we're justified and that brings him glory. We we're in the holy place and that's where we're sanctified and that brings him glory. And now we get into the holy of holies that the veil was torn so that we can have access. We don't have to talk to a priest before he comes straight to Jesus. We don't have to talk to Pastor Caleb and Pastor Christy or all the staff like at Project Church in order for us to have access. The prayers that you pray, pray are powerful enough Do you hear me? When you have faith in Jesus, the prayers of a righteous man availeth much and you are only made righteous through Jesus. You're not made righteous through your relationship with Chrissy. You're not made righteous because you read the Bible. You are made righteous because you believe in someone who can actually save you. And that's the savior of the world. That's the one who tore the veil so that you can have access to him. You are not limited. He's saying, come to me. I want you to experience me. I want you to experience my perfect peace. Just admit you need me. Just admit that you need him. And here's what happens. The Ark of the Covenant and the Holy of Holies, on top of that, between two angelic creatures made of gold, God said, that is where the mercy seat goes. The mercy seat was on top of the presence of God. The Ark of the Covenant, you know, that Ark that that, that held all those miraculous items, that's where the, the mercy seat was. And I want you to know that when we get into the Holy of Holies, when we move past the veil, that is where we receive not glorification, but that's where we receive mercy. And I think everyone in this room needs to start recognizing when you recognize your desperate need of him, you can finally receive his mercy because we all deserve death. See, again, you just smile when things are kind of hard to say. We all deserve death, but because we serve a merciful God who was the ultimate sacrifice, who was the ultimate sacrifice, the ultimate high priest, the one who had access to the Father because he died and rose again, we have access to the Father. And when we receive the mercy, then we bring him glory. The Holy of Holies, when we are in relationship with God, when we are face to face with him, that is where we receive his glory, not No, that's where we receive His mercy, not glory. Remember what I said earlier? Too many of us are trying to steal glory from God and we're trying to do things on our own and we're self-sufficient. Until we get desperate, we will never receive mercy. When we finally receive mercy, then that's when He is glorified. That's when we experience His perfect peace. He's glorified through His church, which is the tabernacle, and He is glorified when you finally accept Him. Why? Because when you accept Him, He is the ultimate sacrifice. He is the ultimate priest. He is the flesh. Um, the, his flesh is the veil that was broken and shattered and torn for us. He's the one who rose again so that we might have life. He will never be glorified in your life if you think you don't need him? Do you want to bring him glory? Do you want to give him praise? I'm heartbroken for the people who think they don't need him. They're missing out on his mercy. Surely goodness and mercy will follow us all the days of our life, but not until we finally receive him. He wants you to receive him. He wants you to be the king He wants you to make him the king of your life, the Lord of your life. No longer are you making and calling the shots for your life. When you finally yield to him, make space for him, then you can receive his mercy and he sits on the throne of your heart. You experience his presence. And when you experience his presence, he is glorified and the world finally knows the reason why you're good, the reason why you experience joy, the reason why you experience peace is because there's a Jesus, there's a savior who loved you, who saved you, that redeemed you, that reconciled you to himself. He wants to save you. He wants to redeem you. That was the whole point of the tabernacle. 
that there would be reconciliation between God and sinners and every single one of us, every single person on this stage, every single person from the street to the seat, we are all in desperate need of him. You want your marriage to get better? Then get desperate for him. You wanna get your, your work situation figured out? then get desperate for him. You wanna get reconciliation with your family? Then get desperate for him. You wanna get some marital help? I said that twice, that must be an issue. Then then get desperate for him. If you wanna know the future, you wanna know your purpose in life, get desperate for him. Because there's a God that wants to live and dwell inside of you, change you and transform you so that you might give him glory. Would you stand in this place? We're gonna sing a song and I, we left room at the end of the service just so that you could experience some worship to really solidify the message. We are His tabernacle. He wants to dwell in you, change you, transform you, renew you. And we still have a little bit left in the service. So I just encourage you, take the time to sing the song and give Him your heart today.